the universe may or may not be three-dimensional. Certainly, three dimensions is the best possible approximation to an infinite universe. Just as an example, the universe doesn't have an obvious centre. It's impossible to think about a shape that doesn't have a, a centre. It's impossible to visualise or imagine it. And so it's very difficult to think about a non-3D universe. Whereas, of course, most of the time it works to think about a, a 3D universe. It doesn't work to understand the shape of the universe using three dimensions. Let's see why. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to use numbers as evidence for our shape of the universe, which is not in 3D. And we will do that using the idea that, or a couple of ideas, but the main one being that the universe is 93 billion light years wide, but only 13.8 billion years old. Actually, we're going to do it in two stages because it, with the start, we'll set up a situation that we know is wrong, because that doesn't really count, but it puts us on the same page. Then we'll go to step one, and then we'll go to step two, which is the final stage where we will see figures that provide us with, with our evidence. To start off then, to start off then, we have the simple universe, or in fact the two simple universe, but you'll see what I mean. So we start off and we assume that you, the universe was created out of the blue with a size of 1 and an expansion rate of 1. So, after the first period of time, the expansion rate has caused the size of the universe to double. I'm going to make a, an assumption at this point, which is, the, which is that the expansion doesn't continue at this rate. So the expansion starts off at a certain rate and then it starts reducing. And I'm going to make the simplest possible uh, assumption, which is that the expansion is halving. So the expansion rate starts off at one, but then it goes to a half, a quarter, an eighth, and so on, giving us a half, a quarter, an eighth, and so on. Giving us this scenario where the universe starts off at size one with no times passed. After a certain rate of time, it doubles in size. After a certain rate of time, again, it increases, but only a half this time. So it's now two and a half the size it was. Then it's two and three quarters, two and seven eighths, and so on, up until essentially we start to approach the limit, which is the maximum size of, of three. Now this isn't meant to be the shape of the universe. I'm just establishing these figures so that we can bring in what we already know about the universe. So it's just a convenience to get us started. And now we can go to step one. Step one. Now, we're all familiar with the idea of simple interest and compound interest. The idea of simple interest is that your interest is added to your capital once, twice, three times, four times, etc. And that increases your capital. Compound interest is where interest is added to the capital, but also the interest that's already been added. So you get interest on your interest, and that, create, that, that, that gives us the, the term compound interest. It's a small difference, but it's an important difference because it means that your money is treated all the same. Your capital and your interest are effectively one thing. We're going to do that now with the expansion of the universe. So I'm going to explain that 
after a period of, after a certain period of time, the expansion of the universe causes it to double in size. From then onwards, the expansion of the universe reduces, so it becomes a half, a quarter, an eighth. This is exactly what we've already seen, and we know it's not right. But what we're doing now is we're saying that this part of the universe continues to expand at this rate. This part of the universe continues to expand at this rate. Each, each time period which results in the universe expanding means that all the bits of the universe continue to expand at the rate they originally had. It's, it's, it's not a complicated idea, but it is an unusual idea. Now, what this does is it, is it makes our universe far more interesting because the size of our universe is now, it's not increasing exponentially in a ridiculous and therefore questionably a way that uh, causes us to question the purpose that it, of this uh, creation. So this is an appealing appealingly elegant uh, design for a universe and furthermore it's not necessarily it's not obviously wrong because at some point this universe really does become 13.8 whatever the unit of measurement is in our case we're using light years uh, billion light billions of light years at some point it does reach 13.8 as its size Okay, so that's a, that's a very, very straightforward use of numbers in a very understandable way. So I really don't think anybody will have any problem with, with what I'm suggesting here. That gives us the opportunity to move on to stage, on to step two, where we're going to be a little bit more ambitious. It doesn't look very ambitious to start off with, but what is ambitious about it is that we are directly making use of philosophy. So we're talking about Zeno's frog. Now, for those who don't know, probably not many, uh, Zeno was a Greek philosopher who lived 2,000 years ago and identified the elements of paradox in the physical universe that he observed. And he illustrated this by imagining a frog on a lily pad at the centre of a pond trying to get out of the pond. Now Zeno's frog can see the edge of the pond and he thinks oh that's really easy I can jump half that distance with my first jump. I'll, I'll get out of here in a couple of jumps no problem. So the frog jumps from the lily pad to the next lily pad and it has indeed jumped half the distance to the edge of the pond. However, it's now a bit tired. So it says, well, actually, I'm not going to get all the way to the edge with my next job, with my next jump. I'm going to go halfway because I'm, I'm tired. So I'm going to, it's going to be a shorter hop. It makes the next jump. And sure enough, it's gone halfway again. So it's now three quarters of the way towards the edge of the lake. I'm sure you know where this is going, but bear with me, I'll, uh, I'll dot the I's and cross the T's. So it's jumped three quarters of the way to the edge of the lake. Now the frog is still thinking, I'll be out of here in a couple of hops, it's really no problem. I'm a bit tireder than I was, but I'll still carry on. Makes the next hop, jumps seven eighths now. And now it's even closer to the edge of the pond, and it's even more simple for it to escape it thinks. But of course Zeno's very clever paradox was that it doesn't matter how many jump, jumps the frog makes when it jumps only a maximum of half each time it will never escape the pond. Okay why does that matter? This expansion rate that we've been talking about we've looked at it as if we were outside the universe. We're not outside the universe, we're inside the universe.
us. We can, if we want to, and if it's justifiable, we can consider this from the point of view of being inside and thus being the reciprocal of the number we've given it. So now the universe, instead of starting off with a, uh, a, a, with a size of one and dropping to a, a size of a half, now doubles and it, it, it attains a size of two because that's the reciprocal of a half. Then it doubles again, it changes the size of four, which is the reciprocal of a quarter, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. Before you know it, the apparent size becomes exponentially large from, from inside the universe's point of view. Why are we doing that? Because the frog can't see the centre of the universe. It can only see the edge of the universe. And also, it's not the frog that's jumping in the, in the example of the universe. It's the lily pad that is moving in this example. It's space itself. So therefore, the frog is looking at the hops in reverse. It's, it, it's seeing the lily pad moving in, inwards and the, the unit that it's using as a measure gets halved but the frog is looking across all of the previous units so every time this jump halves the frog sees all of the previous suddenly double in size because it's looking at the edge of the universe. Finally then another way to think about this one way to understand the universe's expansion is that it is expanding, but another way to understand what we see without making any assumption is that it's imploding. There would be the same characteristics if the universe was falling into the centre as there are, from our point of view, as there are, by looking at it, as falling away from the centre. So imagine it like this. Instead of the Big Bang, it, Big Bang is exploding away from a centre, imagine it imploding into a centre. Even though there's no centre and it's not 3D, this is still the right way to be approximating what we're seeing. So instead of length or depth, we are simply seeing it as either outwards or inwards. And that's not a three-dimensional view of the, of the universe. And in fact, it corrects what is wrong about a three-dimensional view of the universe. Let's take that a little bit more slowly and just review that again. So our assumption to start off with, the simplest assumption, is that everything is expanding. So the frog jumps half the distance to the edge each time and the... The, we, can, we can see that the uh, expansion rate is halving. However, our intuition, and it was Blaise Pascal, who didn't know anything about the expansion of the universe, Blaise Pascal said, the universe is a place whose centre is everywhere and whose edge is nowhere, which is an extremely... <laughs> an unbelievably astute insight into the actual nature of the universe. So it is indeed our intuition that the lily pad is moving and not the frog. And then finally, we acknowledge that the frog isn't really at the edge or the centre of the universe, topologically certainly not. So when the lily pad moves, the frog sees it as the universe has doubled. But what I can say is that if we interpolate... Now, OK, I should mention as well that this figure here is the apparent size, which is still a very, very important measure. This figure here is the real size, and this figure here is 
not the age of the universe at all. It's it's always it's what it's always been, which is simply a start or a, a sample point. The expansion of the universe is a continuous function. We're looking at it in steps for our for our convenience. What is interesting then is that we can interpolate the important step. So you can see that this is thir this begins 13.01. This begins 15.00. Halfway between the two is approximately 14, which is very, very close to 13.8. If we take the equivalent point at the apparent size of the universe, then the, diff the uh, halfway point between 64 and 128 is 96. And 96 is very very close only just slightly more than 93 just as 14 is very very close and slightly more than 13.8 so therefore this with these very simple three rules starting off with a a, a, a size of one having an expansion rate that's halving and looking at these figures as being uh, in relation to each other. So it doesn't matter what unit we're using. The fact, as long as we're using the same unit. So the reason why we've got 96 and 14 is not because there's something special about a billion light years, or, 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 or yeah, it's not, not something special about a billion light years. It is just that the ratio between that number and that number is constant. So it doesn't matter how old the universe is or what size it is, that there will always be that constant ratio between them. So this is a, a, an explanation that doesn't require the universe to expand. It doesn't require any, any uh, outside interference. And it is, it, it, I, I would say clearly, elegant